Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait a few minutes for more people to join. Let's wait maybe one or two more minutes. Okay, I think it's okay because it seems stagnant. Oh no, still people joining. Let's start at 10, uh, 10 Okay, let's start. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're introducing you our webinar, how to mitigate currency risk when trading with Hong Kong and China from Belgium. So let's go on to the next slide and I'll introduce you our speakers for today. So today we have Hans de Bakker, who is director of Belgium Hong Kong Society. We have Jonathan Wang, who is country manager Hong Kong China at Ibery. And we have Isabel Yeku, who is Director of Asia Pacific Initiatives at Ibri. So I'm super happy to give the mic to Hans de Bakker, who will kickstart this presentation for us today. Thank you very much. And um, a very good morning to our European participants and a very good late afternoon to our Asian participants. All welcome. Um, I'm very happy to uh, bring together these three organizers today. I have lived seven and a half years in Hong Kong. So basically, let me first introduce the BLCC, uh, the Belgian Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce. Obviously, it's based in Hong Kong. Uh, it's a membership organization. They provide a platform to all the Belgian and Luxembourgish companies and the individuals to connect, grow their business, and achieve their professional goals as from Hong Kong. And I'm very happy here that Femke de B, general manager, is also with us today. So if you would like to become a member or join events, as from Hong Kong, you can contact her. Um, we are the Belgian Hong Kong Society. We are based at the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office in Brussels. We are also a membership organization. We are promoting business, cultural, and governmental ties between Belgium and Hong Kong since many years. I think we started in 76. Uh, and if you would like to become a member of us 
or join events, you can contact myself or Annie Long, our secretary, via the email that you can see. And last but not least, um, I'm very happy that we brought together three parties and the main party today is Avery. Avery is a fintech company specializing in Forex and payments. Uh, for them, the world has no boundaries, I understand. And if you would like to become a client, you can reach out to info at um, This is it for the introduction of the three co-hosts today. So let me immediately hand over to Jonathan Wang, country manager for Hong Kong and China of Airbury. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind words. So um, um, for those of you who we haven't had the pleasure to serve, so I'll just briefly introduce Airbury's um, as a company. So. Uh, we are one of these, um, let's say, headquartered in, in London as a fintech. We're currently valued as Unicorn. So we set off in 2009 with four employees. Now we have grown into a business with 1,300 employees covered in the 22 countries with 32 offices we have. The internal currency capabilities, um, as has already touched upon, so we currently have, cover up to 130 different currencies. We provide sport, forward, and other exotic options uh, that you might be interested in. So in the last 12 years, we have um, helped our clients to execute up to 20, uh, 20 million sterling, and we've been ranked as uh, the Bloomberg top forecasters. Uh, so if you can move to the next page. Um, so what we have touched upon is um, obviously our currency capabilities, but I would also like to highlight that we have local currency capabilities. In those 18 countries, you can have your own local currency account. What that means for you is you don't have to be charged at a rate that you might not even know. You can collect local currencies and then decide when is the best time and with whom, right, the best rate would be. So this is the value offer we can provide um, to all of you potentially want to work with eBrace. Uh, moving to the next page, um, if I can just briefly cover in terms of our presence in China, so uh, we work from our operational hubs in Hong Kong. Uh, so this is where I'm based. We also have offices in Shanghai and Shenzhen, uh, where most of the importers and exporters are based. Uh, so what we can do are twofold. So number one, obviously, for any potential inquiries you might have, whether it's buying or exporting, you know, we can try to see how we can help with that. And another thing is obviously, you know, if your local business is based in Hong Kong, uh, we can also provide local solutions or any other collection account that you might need. So thank you. Thank you, guys. So um, I'll be now be covering uh, specifically on China and then the implications for companies that are buying from China and also selling to China. But um, before I continue, can I confirm that um, everyone is hearing me okay? Because I just saw that there was a comment on the Q&A asking about the sound. So um, can you confirm the sound? It's okay, you guys can hear me. We can hear you. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. So um, let me go then uh, into my part. Just uh, one reminder. So um, you have the Q&A button to address all the questions that you might have. And then at the end of the presentation, we will leave around 10 minutes to go through all the questions that you might have. So just feel free to um, address whatever questions to any of our speakers uh, there in the Q&A. In my section, I will start first with a market update on China and um, a review of what has been the situation since uh, COVID last year. So as we all know, uh, during 2022, China was one of the last countries to continue putting on um, restrictions on COVID, and that had a significant impact on both the China and Hong Kong economy. So not only because of the COVID, but also because of the crisis in uh, property, as well as the weak external demand, we saw how China's economy, along with Hong Kong, slowed down and it was quite below the forecast. So at the beginning of 2022, the forecast was that China would grow 5.5%, but in the end, it only grew 3%. However, in last December, as we all know, the Chinese government actually took quite a sharp U-turn in their previously restrictive policy around uh, COVID. So they started easing all the restrictions, partly we feel as well because of the protests and um, 
the investors start becoming more positive about China and Hong Kong's economy. And then the economic figures that we started seeing were also on the positive side. So what was the impact on uh, the local currency, right? The Chinese Yuan. In 2022, we actually saw how the RMB continuously weakened against the USD, achieving its lower turns around uh, end of October, November, where one USD could exchange as much as 7.32 RMB, which is a lot. And uh, please remember all these figures because we will also go through them later on in a third part of our presentation. Then uh, because of the opening up of China after COVID and I, what I was saying about the optimism of the investors, we started seeing how um, the RMB rebounded sharply and actually the forecast as well from our Ibris FX market experts is that um, the RMB is gonna strengthen this year and we're quite bullish about it. And we believe that even by the end of this year, we could see an RMB as low as one USD trading at a 6.5 RMB. Then um, moving on now to some considerations for companies that are selling into China. So um, these are obviously three of the questions that um, we get most frequently from our clients that are looking to expand or are already expanding into China. I'm sure um, there are many more, but I uh, will try to briefly cover like these three topics. Which are the capital controls that um, companies will face in China? Then how do you receive funds from your clients that are based in China? And if I want to enter the China market, what are a good place where I can start my China expansion? So uh, in terms of the capital controls that um, we have in China. So sending funds from China, it's quite restricted and um, both companies and individuals, they can only send funds from China to overseas under certain categories that are authorized by the Chinese authorities. So for business, these are a cross-border trade of goods, services, so we could be talking about um, overseas traveling, then overseas education and uh, conferences. So in this instance, where there is a cross-border exchange of goods or services happening, as long as the overseas company, so the exporter, um, is issuing an invoice to their counterparty in China, and then the goods or services are directly sent into mainland China, then the company in China that is acquiring the goods or services cross-border can directly send funds by going to their bank, submitting all the paperwork, and then sending the funds. So there are, in this case, no restrictions in terms of the ticket size. And um, as long as it's justified by the proper invoice and paperwork, then um, your client would be able to send you funds cross-border. In addition to that, Every individual in China, they have a foreign quota of 50,000 USD or equivalent per year, which they can be using for a variety of reasons. If you want to um, shop in overseas marketplaces, travel, or even buy property. But um, it's only restricted to this 50,000 USD. Anything that is outside of these categories that I just mentioned, it would need to go through an additional approval from the foreign exchange regulator, which is safe. So oftentimes, some of our clients that are working with China, um, what they would do is that they will be sending goods from Belgium to Hong Kong, but then the funds will be paid, for instance, from mainland China. So in this case, it would actually not work, right? Because um, your goods are being sent to a destination that is different from the place where you are Play, you are paying the funds. So this is something very important for all of our audience here that um, is selling or are looking to sell into China. Then the next part is if I start selling into China, right? So how can I receive my funds from my clients in China? And um, what is the best setup that I can do? The two most common setups that we have seen among our clients, um, first one, is that you directly sell as a local. What do we mean? So if you are 
a large company that are willing to commit resources in China, then um, they would normally build their own local commercial office in mainland China so that you directly sell locally to your clients in China. This way, you're actually removing the hassle for your clients in China to having to send the funds cross border, right? So how the flow of funds would be is that um, the Chinese client in this case will directly pay local RMB into your sales office in China. And then it would be your sales office in mainland China that is responsible for sending the funds to the parent company in Belgium. So in this case, something to take into account is that um, the sales office in China can only send the funds to the amount of the invoice extended by the parent company in Belgium. So let's say that um, my sales office in China, it's adding an extra margin on top of the cost of the price, uh, on top of the cost of the goods, right? So um, this profit margin, actually, I cannot send it back to my parent company as a cross-border trade of goods. This would have to be a repatriation of profit that follows a separate process with uh, the foreign exchange regulator. So it's possible, but it's not as straightforward as directly sending uh, cross-border funds for export of goods um, and going to your bank. So it requires like some more effort. Then the second option, right, for uh, companies that are just starting and um, they already have target uh, importers in China that are interested in buying their goods, right? So this is the easiest for the exporter because you're just sending the, uh, the goods cross-border from Belgium directly into your Chinese counterparty. Obviously in this case, um, you need to make sure that your counterparty in China actually has the proper import authorization so that they can actually send funds cross-border and the burden of sending these funds from China to overseas will fall on uh, the importer. So how the process works for sending funds, every time that um, a company wants to send funds cross-border, you always have to go physically to uh, your bank's office, fill out all the paperwork, convert um, your RMB into euros, and then uh, pay euros into your exporter, right? That process um, as a whole will take in general, if sure, like three, four days, three, four days, up to one week, depending on the corresponding uh, bank. And um, what is the proposal that Ibri is doing to also help clients that are selling into China? So because of the capabilities that we have globally, including Hong Kong and China, as Jonathan was just sharing, we're actually able to open an account in RMB in Hong Kong to facilitate our exporters selling more easily from China. Because most of the exporters, they would normally sell in the local currency, which is euros, right? But how about if you want to enter the Chinese market, be more competitive and differentiate from your competitors, sell as a local, regardless of whether you have a local office or not, and directly quote them in their own currency. So uh, through this solution that we offer of opening a local account in Hong Kong, our Belgian company, let's say they are in the second case on the right, right? They sell cross-border. So they don't really need to have an entity in Hong Kong. Just by being Ibris client, they can have an account open in Hong Kong in CNH so that their importer in China can directly send RMB, so they don't need to convert the funds from RMB into Euro. And they're saving as well paperwork with the bank because they're directly sending RMB from China to Hong Kong. One remark, even though Hong Kong is part of uh, China, it's still two systems. So that means that when I send funds from China to Hong Kong, it's still considered cross-border. So we cannot get around the restriction on sending funds internationally by having an account in Hong Kong. But what the account in Hong Kong facilitates to the exporters is first that the funds will arrive with a minute because it's from mainland China to Hong Kong. And then we'll be able to convert the RMB into Euro and um, credit it directly into the exporters uh, destination account in Belgium. And because of the time difference, there's right now seven hours difference between China and Belgium. The Belgian company would actually receive 
the funds directly in their account in Belgium in the same day. So that's significantly saving time and cost on this. And moving on to the third question on the considerations for exporters. So where to start for China expansion? So this is just um, some rough ideas that we want to share out of what we see our clients are doing. So um, most of the clients that will tap into the major marketplaces in China. So Tmall Global, it's owned by Alibaba, JD.com, and then Pinduoduo. So these are the main marketplaces where companies will look into set up a shop. Also, um, WeChat. So WeChat, for those of you that don't know, it's a messaging system that is similar to WhatsApp, but it goes beyond that. It's actually a full ecosystem where um, companies can connect with each other and they can even have what we call their own WeChat mini program where they can set up their own shop and then sell their products. Something like having like um, your own website store. And also like in the last few years, live streaming is becoming really popular in China. So social commerce is something that um, we also suggest companies looking at. So um, the main two social commerce platforms are uh, Toyin. So Toyin is the Chinese version for uh, TikTok and that's mostly targeted to tier one cities in China. And you have as well Huaizhou, which is more targeted to tier two, tier three. So both are based on um, short videos and some companies, they would even like um, get some Chinese influencers to promote their brand, so increase their brand awareness. So actually, if uh, you're looking to enter into China, something as well to add that is quite important is um, to look for a local partner that really knows the, look, the local nuances. And also because China is very big, like even within each region, the cultural lifestyle could be very different. So um, this is on the exporter side. Now I'm gonna move on to the importers where I'm very happy to also present the two additional guest speakers that we have invited. So both of them are our clients, Anouk. It's um, our client in Belgium that is importing from China. And Patrick is our client in Hong Kong that is actually selling. So we're very honored to have them with us today so that they can also share from their, their perspective, their experience on uh, the China West Corridor. So Anouk, if you want to introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining the webinar. I am Anouk. I run a company called Red Robin Design, and we're specialized in development and importing and distributing uh, licensed products, namely bags, um, stationary items, and small gift items, and we distribute throughout Europe. All our funds obviously come into um, Belgium, but all is paid in US dollars, so it's essential to have a good currency uh, partner here. Thank you, Anouk, and welcome again. Patrick, over to you. Hi, can you see me? Yeah, Hi, good we morning, can see you everyone. and we can hear you. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I am Patrick from Jupo Jewel. So we mostly provide the private label and custom manufacturing of high-end fashion jewelry. So we deal with uh, silver, uh, brass, steel, and implant titanium. So now we are mostly working with a lot of uh, accessible la la accessible luxury jewelry brands in the US and uh, Europe, which are mostly sold in the department stores. Uh, and we are very confident with, uh, with our expertise. So of course we, we are very confident to replicate any jewelry pieces like a high end you can ever source, you have ever sourced in China. So, and of course we do waterproof jewelry. Mm. So if you guys have any questions you know, regarding the jewelry production, just let me know. Thank you. Hello, I just want to mention very quickly, you can send your questions to the Q&A at any time during the webinar, just so you know. So if you have any questions for Patrick, Anouk or Isabel, please send them to the Q&A already. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Anouk, Patrick. 
So um, after the webinar, we will also send a thank you email and then we will include the contact emails of the speakers. So if any of you wants to connect offline with any of our speakers, um, just feel free to do so. So without delay, let's move on to the considerations for importers. So companies buying from China that we would like to discuss today with both Anouk and Patrick. So what is the impact of exchange rates on uh, my purchasing costs? Then how can I improve my payment terms as a company buying from China? And um, why do I see that some of my suppliers, they are based in mainland China, but they are actually invoicing me from Hong Kong. So uh, on the impact of exchange rates on uh, my purchasing costs, and if you remember what I was saying earlier on, on what has been the volatility of um, dollar RMB in last year. Yeah. So for those of you that are buying from China or are planning to buy from China, right? So I want to invite you to think as well, what was the impact of um, the exchange rate on my prices last year? Did I get um, variations on my prices? And um, this is something that we will illustrate with an example. So let's say that um, I, am a supply, I am a supplier that is quoting a price of um, 100 USD last year, beginning of March. So um, as a client, I normally don't know uh, what is my supplier's base price, but we all know that uh, the production is based on China. So their base cost would be in RMB. And just for uh, this exercise, let's say that um, it's 632 RMB. So as a supplier, when I set my export prices in USD, I do it at the current exchange rate. So I say, okay, so 632 divided my current spot rate as March 1st, 6.32. Then I quote 100 USD to my client. So notice how through this chart, because of the volatility that the RMB suffered, and um, it was most time of the year weakening against USD. So that meant that actually, the exporters or supplier were getting additional margin from the exchange rates moving in their favor. So in November, 20 sec uh, November 2nd, sorry, one USD could exchange as much as 7.34. So with the same USD prices, 100, I was going from uh, not only getting 632, which is my base price, I was getting additional profits of 102 RMB which is what we're showing on um, the third row in our green bubble. But then <clears throat> the situation changed, as we were saying, because China started um, easing down on its COVID restrictions. So actually, in this case, started end of the year, beginning of um, this year, the RMB significantly strengthened against USD. So what happens now? So now um, there's a challenge for the supplier because I've kept uh, my prices not change during the year. I might have some increases in additional costs, but that was compensated by the additional profit I was getting on FX. But now um, I am losing this FX margin and then the exchange rates are moving against me. So what I do is that I increase my prices because it's beginning of the year. So I go from 100 to 108 so that I recoup some of my FX profit. And um, the issue that we see is that for many of the suppliers, Actually, most of the suppliers in China, they are not really hedging. So even if on the importer or buyer side, they are covering their euro against USD risk, they are still being impacted by dollar RMB because RMB is the base price for our supplier. So just think about last year, right? Like, um, did my supplier give me any discount? because um, the exchange rate were significantly in their favor or were the prices just stable? Because this is also what we're calling one-way risk. A lot of times uh, the importer doesn't fully get the benefit of favorable exchange rate, but you need to share on um, the negative movements of the exchange rate. And um, the issue is that also a lot of times the support, the exporters, they might be reluctant to as well receive in RMB because they prefer to receive in USD. So the two options that we have been working on to assist our client, it's either if the supplier is willing to switch 
from uh, receiving USD to receiving RMB, then that's one option, right? Then we can help our clients directly convert from Euro to RMB, do an FX forward to manage the risk of the whole supply chain. And um, the supplier and buyer don't need to worry about the exchange risk. But how about for suppliers that um, don't want to switch to RMB because of various reasons, more hassle with the bank and paperwork, and they want to stick to USD. This is why um, we have a team in Hong Kong of suppliers liaison that what they specialize is in helping to bridge the communications between buyers and suppliers and uh, talk to the suppliers to explain to them um, the concepts of uh, risk management, um, how we can help to improve the prices for both parties and remove the foreign exchange rate um, so that we make sure that both the buyer and the supplier, they are protected against market volatility, especially in times like last year when the market was really volatile. So um, Anouk, from your side, um, would you like to share what was your experience with uh, the prices with your suppliers? Well, I've been working with Chinese suppliers for the past 15 years. And traditionally, when we um, have quotations, we receive quotations for our developments, by the time we have a set price, it takes another 60 to 90 days of production lead time. So by they, in fact, the, the suppliers calculate their exchange risk based on a possible situation after uh, 90 days, which is more than as good as three months. So in the end, what you what you what you pay today is not what your money is worth within three months. So in order to exclude this exchange rate risk for the supplier, it's easier for us to start calculating the prices in RMBs and paying the suppliers in their own currency. So for us, it's just a it's much easier to avoid um, big big price increases in between the the moment of of setting your price and and the time of shipment because Chinese suppliers there's never a fixed price. It's what they say now if it's really in their disadvantage they change the price anyways and in the end you pay up you end up paying extra. So for us it's a really big advantage that we can now negotiate prices in RMB and have a set currency exchange rate for us to calculate our, our prices to our customers, either in US dollars or in or in euros, depending on what the customer prefers. Okay, thank you, Anouk. So actually in your case, you're actually able to do directly Euro RMB so that um, you remove the risk for both parties. For both parties, but certain customers within Europe still prefer paying us in US dollars for whatever reasons. But even if we change into euros, it helps us a lot if we just have clear um, exchange rates and not having if not having to to consider the risks that we have with the with the suppliers when they calculate their exchange rate risk. Yeah. Okay, Patrick. So um, I see I see you're also eager to share your view, right? So can I can we hear your view from the suppliers how you set prices and how you manage the FX risk? Okay. So firstly, I want to share why we prefer US uh, US dollars over RMB because. Uh, U.S. dollars is uh, most widely used currency in the world, and is less likely to, you know, depreciate very suddenly. And the second, because we our our company are based in Hong Kong, so we also pay to our suppliers, you know, by with USD dollars instead of RMB. So if we receive the RMB, so we need an extra step to exchange RMB for USD again, which contains a lot of risk. And also, you know, because like uh, like uh, Isabel just mentioned, uh, it's very hard to send money to out of China. So that's why we have to, you know, to have some. We need, uh, we need some. And there are a lot of mainland companies. And they need the USD dollars uh, out of China. Uh, so we give the USD dollars to them in Hong Kong, and they give the uh, RMB in the mainland to us. So that's why we prefer the USD dollars. But, but, but there's also some risk involving, involving when we use, when we price our products with US dollars, because when the, the, the USD to RMB rate decrease, we will have a loss. So what we do is when we price our products 
we will have some some like cushion room. You know, for example, if current rate is six uh, six point eight six, we might uh, price our item we based on six point uh, six uh, six point five, which means in this case we have you know some cushion room just in case the the USD to RMB rate decrease. But this cushion room has to be well managed because we are also com competing with some other. Chinese suppliers. So if this room is too big, it's not good for us to in this supplier competition. Uh, and also before uh, before we meet with uh, every, we don't know you know know much about the exchange rate log. So if you, you if they can provide some this kind of this uh, log system, which will make the whole thing simpler, the the whole process easier. So it can reduce so reduce the uncertainty of some uh, exchange rate loss. And this is maybe something we won't have a try later. Thanks a lot, Patrick, for your sharing. So um, basically what we could hope is um, the caution that he was mentioning in order to protect against the foreign exchange volatility, instead of having to set this additional caution or buffer, then um, through locking the exchange rate, so doing um, FX forward, we can actually help to reduce the caution and then um, increase, the, uh, increase the competitiveness of the prices for both parties. So um, let me move on to the next topic, which is as a company buying from China, how can I improve my payment terms? Because you always have um, this, let's say, conflict of um or of interest well not really conflict of interest right but opposing opposed interest that um the buyer would like to negotiate some payment terms with the supplier in china but at the same time the supplier might be reluctant to accept anything that is not upfront payment either because they could have liquidity constraints themselves or a lot of times especially if it's a new relationship because they don't know the client that well, right? So they're reluctant to provide payment terms. What Ibri has been um, working with our clients, given that we are in both ends of the transaction, both in the buyer and on the supplier side, and um, that we're able to offer an import finance product is to try to intermediate into this and then provide some solution so that it could be a win-win for both parties. So how would this uh, process work? with an example. So if an, an importer in Belgium and a client of Ibri, and then I got a line approved with Ibri. So I can use this line to negotiate better payment terms with my exporter and then um, make available to them this credit line so that even though they give me payment terms, they are able to get upfront payments themselves through Ibri by paying the interest cost. So let's say that um, the exporter releases an invoice for 100 USD and sends it to the importer. So the importer in this case will forward the invoice to Ibri. And um, the exporter, they will ask for upfront payment, but they are willing to accept three months payment terms from um, the client, the importer in this case. So in this case, Ibri gets um, the invoice, it's 100 USD. We calculate what would be the three months uh, financing cost so just let's say it's three USD. So we will pay the supplier upfront the 97 USD. So from the supplier's side, he's settled. He's gonna be covering this financing cost, but at the same time, because he's getting the payment upfront, then um, he can also accelerate his purchasing with um, his factories, pay them earlier, and then get a discount out of that, right? So the whole supply chain becomes more efficient. And on the buyer's side, so um, if this is a buyer that is liquidity rich, or they could be getting already financing lines from other banks, they have this additional line with Ibri that they would not have used if there were not uh, requirements from the supplier. But in this case, they're actually able to utilize this line to get better payment terms from the supplier. And at the same time, um, they are not covering for the cost of uh, this line. So after three months, the importer will just pay back every 100 USD and that's settled. So that would also breed um, the worry of the supplier if I don't trust the client because Ibri has already paid an upfront. So this is actually a win-win situation for all parties. And um, Anouk again, 
I want to pass it to you and then um, hear your experience on this with the suppliers. Well, obviously, if you um, work with retailers directly, then everybody knows that the payment terms there are horrendously long. They go from 90 up to 120 days where we pay our suppliers against the document. So as soon as the containers arrive in the port of destination, we have to pay the full um, amount to the to the makers. It helps a lot if you can have a credit line of this type so the maker can get his money in time and we have the, we can keep the funds for a while to keep working because it, it really helps our cash flow. Um, well, it improves our cash flow if you can do it this way. If not, you have to wait forever to get your money from your customers and your supplier just gets very frustrated if he doesn't get his money in time. So obviously it's a very, very good way to work. Thank you, Anouk. So um, Patrick, do you want to share from your side? Uh, do you provide payment terms to your clients or is this something that um, they ask you? Okay, of course they ask for that. But to be honest, always, we, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But to be honest, we don't like uh, payment terms because I, I think everybody knows that the time, the money has time values. So, and also the payment terms is part of pricing when we code. So there's, there's one thing to, uh, which is very certain is that the price will be higher with terms compared to the, uh, to the price without the terms. But, but during the business, uh, you know, in the business, this, the competition is very fierce very fierce. So especially when we, are, when we are talking with some like uh, big retailers or giant players, we have to accept the term, but we are not allowed to increase our price. So which is really bad. So in this case, uh, we have to evaluate the risk of these payment terms. So we will firstly, we will calculate how much money we have made from this client. And then we use a portion of this money to be the credit line. So this line is, you know, is totally depending on how much money we have made from them. But if we have, you know, some competitors which has made more money than us for, uh, from them, so which means they will provide a much higher credit line than us, which, which uh, this put us in a very bad situation in the competition. So uh, if, if Avery can have, you know, if you guys can have, make some like a thorough analysis of the, the, this customer, and you, if you can provide us a much bigger, a much bigger credit line, then, uh, then the line we, we evaluate by ourselves. This will make us more competitive uh, in our supplier competition. But, 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 but the bad way is we have to pay for the financial, some financial costs. So we have to you know, do some math and see if we can go with it. <laughs> it's better to yeah. be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> obviously <laughs> and then um you raised a good point patrick um which i didn't mention about the competitiveness no, right this can only be also be used in terms of yeah. payment terms as a way to differentiate from your competition right so if you have similar products yeah, yes. but you are able to offer payment terms then um it's a winning point that you have against competition that you could use so um mm -hmm. Moving on to um, the last bit of the presentation, and then we'll leave time for the Q&As. It's um, some Chinese suppliers that they actually invoice from Hong Kong, um, because we see that with a lot of our clients. I thought I would explain what are like um, the two different types of common exporter setups that um, we see in China. So on the left, uh, we talk about exporters that are invoicing from mainland China. So these are mainly large companies that um, need to get VAT refund from their products. So therefore they need to receive the funds cross-border directly from overseas. So how does the VAT works in China in a nutshell? Basically all the products that you manufacture in mainland China are subject to a VAT that can be between 5% to 13%, um, one three. So that's actually quite considerable for the exporters. And once you export the goods overseas, you're actually able to do the relevant paperwork and then go to the tax office to get the refund on this VAT. So for these companies, that means they need to have quite a sophisticated accounting finance function in place so that they can do this VAT refund. And actually they have the full export license in mainland China, which means that they can have um, their bank account in mainland China to receive cross-border funds directly. 
some of these companies, they will still set up an entity in Hong Kong because it's more tax efficient since the corporate taxes in Hong Kong are significantly lower than in mainland China. Then um, if they have an entity in Hong Kong, the flow would just be, as I um, outlined here, that basically the um, company in mainland China will first export to their trading company in Hong Kong, and then this Hong Kong company will uh, sell to the importer in Belgium. And then the flow of funds would be Belgium pays USD to Hong Kong, and then Hong Kong into mainland China. And in this case, it's all cross-border payments, and there are no issues because of what I just explained. Then you have um, suppliers on the right side, right? So um, actually, like most of China's export landscape, it's uh, composed by small and medium SMEs, right? So for these companies, a lot of them trading companies that they are selling a wide range of products. And sometimes they could be like low value products, like hair accessories, right? That have a very high assortment. So these products, they are actually not subject to any VAT refund in China. So therefore they don't really need to set up this whole system to go for a VAT refund, get the export license. Um, for them, the easiest route is that they will just set up an entity in Hong Kong so that they can sell everything from Hong Kong and receive the funds directly there. And then um, through some other ways, they can just move the funds into uh, mainland China or sometimes pay into their personal account. So if sometimes your suppliers, you get questions on, can you pay to my personal account in mainland China? This is the reason, right? Because um, they are actually not able to send funds cross-border directly into their account in uh, mainland China. So it can only be through um, other ways. So in both cases, and going back to what I was saying on the exporter to provide an account for them to receive RMB from China, we can equally as well provide an account in Hong Kong for the supplier to facilitate then receiving funds from overseas. And also if um, the buyer is already instructing payments through eBRI, and then the supplier in this case is receiving funds through an eBRI account. And in this case, just to explain a bit, this account would actually be under the name of the supplier so that um, we ensure that in the invoice or the details are under the supplier's name, only that um, it is all facilitated by eBRI. So in this case, we will um, ensure that the funds can arrive almost instantly and remove frictions with local banks in Hong Kong, because it's actually quite a challenge, and maybe Patrick can share as well, to open a bank account with um, the local banks in Hong Kong. And a lot of times, like um, they will freeze the funds or like close the account. So this triggers additional issues because then the supplier needs to change a new bank account. And um, this could also give room to some um, fraud. So we had situations, and I hope none of you guys um, encounter it, that um, some froster just impersonate the supplier, hack their email and pretend it to be then, and then change the bank account details and then um, deviate all the funds, right? So by having this account with eBRI and buyer and supplier both have direct communication with eBRI, we ensure that we also minimize this um, sort of risk and then um, fraud cases. So um, Anouk, again, I pass it to you like with your suppliers. Um, do you have suppliers that are paying um, receiving from Hong Kong or mainland China? Yes, we work with both ways. We have suppliers um, who have bank accounts in um, Hong Kong, who have their export office there. And we have suppliers who work directly from China. Um, it depends a little bit on the cooperation we have and the type of maker that we talk to. But in general, we don't have many issues with, well, there used to be the big fraud issue a few years ago. There was many, many of those fraudulent emails um, going around. But because we we managed to set up a trading company there with a team of of girls who manage all our our makers but they they work from hong kong and um, so it just depends on the on the type of of supplier we work with but it's either we pay directly into china or we pay into hong kong but it neither of them cause many issues and payments again through eBury go very very fast so much faster than any uh, regular bank so that is a big advantage thank you anok so Patrick, 
you, your entity is in Hong Kong, right? So yes. can you also share your perspective? Okay. So the reason why we have our entity in Hong Kong is because we want to save a lot from the corporate tax. Because this tax is only levied by levied once. I want we and we want it to take place in Hong Kong. And second is because we need, need to have you know have some account in Hong Kong so that, so that when we want to buy something from outside of China, it's easier for us to pay to them. It's so hard to do, you know to pay the uh, pay the money out of China. And uh, and another very important point is because uh, Hong Kong, if we use our domestic banks, it takes a lot of time to confirm the money has arrived at our account. We have to provide a lot of documents to our domestic banks. And if the, if the documents are not approved, the money will just go back to where it's from. But with the Hong Kong banks, you know, or some other kind of like eBury accounts, it's easier or earlier to confirm the money arrival. So because a lot of, of, of our production will only start once we receive the money. So the faster we confirm the money arrive, the earlier we will start the production. This can short shorten the turnaround time of production and better serve our customers. And the reason why we're now starting to use the Avery is because uh, you guys provide us a local bank in our customers' countries which makes the money, uh, money arrival confirmation earlier. So this is really, really helpful. Thanks a lot, uh, Patrick, and also Anouk. So um, this is my part of um, the presentation. So now we're going to open the floor to Q&A. So Amanda, I'll pass it to you. Okay. Thank you. OK, so the first question in the Q&A is from anonymous attendee. Um, hello, how does it practically work to hedge? Oh, someone just added one. To hedge our currency risk via Ibri. So I will let Isabel maybe answer this question. Yeah, or um, I don't know if Peter or Christoph, because they're um, in Belgium. If you guys want to take this, or you want me to take it, well, you can take it. Go ahead. For me, it's the same. Oh, what is the question? Let me just quickly check. Um, yeah. How does so, it practically um, work? Your head. Yeah, it's uh, it's actually very similar to uh, to a traditional bank. So um, obviously um, we can uh, we, we look at the financials and then um, that works very easily. You can set up an account; it doesn't cost anything. And then we look practically uh, to we can hedge the exposure. It's a, it works very similar like a traditional bank. We also take the position back to back with one of our banking providers. So we can, uh, yeah, we can definitely look into that. All right. Next question yeah. is, is it normal to have a minimum order quantity when receiving inquiry from a new customer? So I think this is a question for Patrick. Yeah, and I think Amanda, we can probably also take um, the next one because um, they're from the same person. How can we save a tax from having an entity in Hong Kong? So, um, Patrick, can you help answer these two questions? Okay, so the first one, I think, uh, for, from our perspective, it's very normal to ask for MOQ. It's, this is because we want to provide a very good price to you. When, so, so we have, you know, to in order to have this economy of scale, we have a minimal order requirement that, so that we can decrease the average cost per piece. And that's why we have MOQ. And just for a second question, how can we save a lot of tax from uh, having an entity? Um, okay, so because we are talking about the corporate tax, as you know, uh, the, the reason why we can save, the, save a lot of tax from, from Hong Kong is it's because the corporate tax rate is very low in Hong Kong compared to the mainland China. For example, uh, during, uh, during the COVID times, the Hong Kong government, they waive all the corporate tax for a certain period of time. So this is really good for us. Thank you, Patrick. So the next question is quite a long one. Here we go. We are a Belgian company buying textiles in China. The lead time between order and production is comparable to Anouk's company. 
In our experience, the USD agreed quote is definite and has never changed unilaterally by our supplier because of exchange rate fluctuations in the 100 day period. In our sector, we pay 30% deposit with order confirmation and balance before shipments. Given our cash flow situation, our management is not really interested in credit lines. In case our supplier, China Mainland, in China Mainland, would be interested in receiving local currency instead of USD, these two advantages would not matter. Credit terms and price adjustments after OC. Do you see any other advantages? I'm going to let the Brussels office, uh, Peter and Christophe, answer this question. Oh, sorry, can I just interfere? To this or can i just give a small oh, answer please, please. I don't, yeah. don't mind. Um, it's a very identical situation but um i understand that their supplier doesn't change prices anymore between the day the price is given and the day that the goods are shipped but either way the, uh, the supplier does calculate uh, a currency exchange risk they always do it's like the like patrick explained so one advantage is that you can exclude um that risk, you know, you, you 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 basically you cover it yourself and you control it yourself. But that is, um, that it's quite substantial if you if you, given the political and economical situation, sometimes there's like up to a six percent price difference if you um, if you if you really know how to negotiate your prices in RMB directly. And um, and another uh, very big advantage with I see with my makers who we pay in RMB is that sometimes you just get things done. Um, easier when you pay them in the local currency and mainly right before Chinese New Year when they have to pay their um, uh, people, their their workers, because then they really need a lot of RMB. So they're usually very happy to um, to receive the RMBs. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Anouk. I, I, I just wanted to add uh, something quickly here. Um, of course, sometimes they um, companies in China they also need USD to uh, to buy uh, hey, for, for their yeah, for their own goods. Um, so you can always definitely look into that. And I think the the whole situation here is to bring uh, to bridge the gap between the supplier and the and the importer, right? I mean, it's just to to have a, com a communication about it and to look how you can obviously mitigate your currency risk. So. That's uh, that's something that, that we can definitely look into. That it's quite a, uh, a, a complex question, so we can, of course, like afterwards, look more into detail into how we can support uh, support your uh, question. All right, thank you so much. I think those are the questions up until now. If anyone has any more questions, please still send them in the Q and A. We can take a few more minutes um, until we we finalize this part. Would anyone else like to say something? I see another question here in the chat. So can Ibri hedge euros RMB during three months or six months or longer? And so the answer is yes, we can do up to five years. So that's the question from our, the answer from our side. Okay, Amanda and participants, I think we can call it a very interesting webinar. Um, on behalf of the BLCC and the Belgian Hong Kong Society, I would like to thank Ebery uh, for hosting this together with us. Thanks for all the participants. Thanks for all the questions. This is a lively debate which can go on directly between the clients and Ebery in the next few weeks and months. So on behalf of BLCC and the BHKS, thank you very much as well. Thank you. Hans. Thank you for this collaboration. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone, you, for joining. Thanks, Thanks everyone. All the parties involved. Bye-bye. And just to, uh, to, to conclude this presentation, on the 16th of March, there will be a webinar on trading with Brazil. So if you would be interested in this webinar as well, we will be sending out invitations. So. Stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys.